Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com, and we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to linode.com slash changelog. Hi, I'm Chris Nova, and it's go time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Go Time. Today's episode is actually number 50, so I think that makes us officially over the hill. What? And maybe, when do we get a senior citizen's discount? 55. (laughs) We belong to AARP. So another five episodes. Yeah. So on the show today, we have myself, Eric St. Martin. Carly Pinto is also here. Hi, and you so mispronounced my name, but I love you. It's okay. (laughs) Yeah, we're, we're moving fast here. Sorry. At least he didn't do the trained monkey thing where he says, say hello, Carlicia. Say hello, Brian. <laughs> yes, yes, Eric, we're trained so monkeys. in that case, say hello, Brian. Ah, <laughs> oh, you're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Eric. And our guest for today is actually Chris Nova. Hi, Chris. Hi. Do you want to give uh, everybody maybe like a little bit of a background of who you are and some of the, the stuff that you're working on? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so I am really into Go, the Go programming language. I work a lot in, in Kubernetes in the container space. Um, I'm constantly like coming up with little open source projects in my spare time. And I work on the Azure team at Microsoft and we're working on bringing Kubernetes to, to Azure and making that awesome. You just answered my first question, which is what's the proper way to say Azure? I say I say Azure because I'm really into like mineral collecting and my favorite mineral is Azurite. So it just kind of like was a no-brainer for me. But I've heard Azure in the wild quite a bit. I would say Azure. Yeah, I actually had the same problem uh trying to figure that out. And I think uh Adam Bikoviak, the producer, might have corrected me during a conversation we had. And I think it's actually based on uh Eastern countries versus Western countries. I think in like the UK, I think they say like uh, Azure or something like that. I, I've definitely heard both. Mm. I just, I go with Azure. And that's what I think most people on my team say. Yeah, see what, I would always use the the je sound. The question is whether we would uh, accent the first syllable or the second one, Azure or Azure. So, well, you say Azure and you work at Microsoft. So we're rolling with that. It's done. All right. Right. It's official. It's official. Sorry, I cannot change it. Is it sore? <laughs> I'm going to call Scott Guthrie and let him know that that's how this is from now on. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got him on speed dial. Done and done. I'll just, act, you're right. I should send him a text that's calling is rude. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about a, a couple of the projects too. Uh, the most recent that came out was uh, draft. We talked about that either last episode or the one before. And that's uh ridiculously cool. Um, did you happen to work on that, that specific project? Um, I've been, obviously we've been working on it for a while before we sort of announced it. And uh, I've been involved with the team. I work fairly closely with them. Uh, I'm actually on like a neighboring team, but the way we do things is everybody, like all the individual contributors kind of all work together. So I've contributed to the project and, and helped kind of along the way. So that, that's a no? That's a no. <laughs> <laughs> just messing with you, Chris. <laughs> I'm feisty today. Can you tell? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. It's going to be a good show. I feel it. So, um, you, you were wait. mostly behind cops, though, wait. right? Chris, yeah. have you finished your, your sentence or you just thoroughly interrupted? No, no, no. You're fine. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So, I, I've worked out a lot in cops. I, I helped bring. Uh, the private topology in, in Amazon to, to cops. Um, that was something I, I coded a lot, like end of last year. And, and now I'm one of the maintainers. And I would say my involvement now is is pretty much, I, I do a lot of code reviews and I help, you know, manage the project on sort of a high level. Um, I'm not contributing like every day, like I used to be several months ago. 
But hopefully I would like to change that as I, I've been going through the, uh, the process of getting Kubernetes up and running on Azure. I'm kind of missing a lot of these old paradigms that we had when I was working on, on Amazon. And I really would like to, in my spare time, dedicate some effort into getting an Azure implementation coded into COPS so that I can get some of those bells and whistles that I'm, I'm used to having in a certain way. So that's something that I'm going to start coding here as soon as I get some free time, probably in the next couple of weeks or so. So I'm excited about that. Here's a question. For those of us who don't have a ton of Azure experience, how, do, how does Azure compare feature-wise to AWS? Are, are you uh, finding that you can still get everything you need done? Is it, um, is it roughly analogous? I, I would say so. I, I think, actually, I kind of like it more because of the way that we handle our resource groups. So what a resource group is, it allows you to, to give an ID to a set of arbitrary resources in Azure. And you can group on them that way. So you just tag everything with a unique name, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a public IP, a VM, a VNet, anything. They all can be tied together with one string. And I think that's pretty handy, especially if you plan on running multiple clusters out of the same account, which is something I did in Amazon all the time and struggled with. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, I've, it's almost one-to-one. -one. Um, I can get a cluster up and running with ACS Engine and one or two commands and that's exactly what I need, and I'm working fine. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's one of those things that I, I keep meaning to play with as well. There's been um, the past maybe five years, it's just been kind of like an explosion of um, different cloud providers. And it's just so hard to get time. You, you don't really want to move your infrastructure too often. That's uh, painful. I think, but it's cool though, because a lot of tools now make it a lot easier to bootstrap a cluster too, especially in the Kubernetes world. Yeah, I was going to say that's, in my mind, one of the big wins for Kubernetes, which is once you get all your infrastructure and all your applications bundled up into the Kubernetes way of doing things, you kind of, you kind of don't really care about the cloud anymore, or at least that's the idea. There might be subtle nuances, but um, I've, I had a ton of personal apps and a ton of projects that I used to run in Amazon that as soon as I had Kate's up and running in Azure, it's like, now I'm just rocking in Azure and life's good. Are you self-hosting? Uh, I, like a I, Kubernetes inside Kubernetes. That's something that I think we're we're going to see in the near future, probably. That's one of those things that it keeps getting on my list. Like since I've seen it done, uh, you know, I know Tectonic does that too. But uh, since I've seen it done, it's like, oh man, like I really want to do that. Just manage the Kubernetes components inside Kubernetes too. Yeah, I mean, it, and that's what's beautiful about it is like in order to get a control plane up and running, you just need to have these these bare minimal set of, of components that are already running in containers. So, I mean, it's a good model. So do you want to talk maybe a little bit about what COPS is for anybody who's not familiar with the project? Sure. Um, so I, and I guess there's a lot of, I don't want to say controversy, but a lot of people kind of put COPS mentally into different spaces. So I'll kind of answer what it is for me. And basically it's, it's sort of what is the layer below Kubernetes. So it'll solve, I have no resources in a cloud, whether that be Azure or AWS. And, uh, you know, I want those resources in place. And then after those are in place, we need to bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster. So COP sort of makes one, like, amalgamation of all that, of all those steps going together. So um, it's a deployment tool, but more importantly, it's also a, a, an aftermarket management tool. So when you do go through the exercise of creating resources, again, whether these are like IP addresses, network interfaces, VNet, VMs, you can store a concept of them. And then if you need to scale them or change them or update them or modify them later, you can. So I think it, it sort of introduces this new paradigm of I need infrastructure and I'm going to probably want to change it later as my use cases grow and evolve and expand. And with COPS, I can do that through one friendly command line tool, which ultimately becomes like an API that you can trust. Hmm. So how does COPS differ in scope from kubeadm? So kubeadm is sort of the second half of what, of what COPS does. kubeadm says the infrastructure is in place and now I, I want to bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster where COPS goes, I'll manage the infrastructure, create it if you don't already have it, and bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster as well. Oh, okay. So um, you're actually speaking about kind of like your development or uh, kind of the history of the development of COPS. 
and uh, lessons learned and, and all that stuff. Without giving away uh, the secret sauce of your talk, uh, do you want to <laughs> kind of give maybe like a little background of kind of uh, what that entails, like maybe some of the struggle that you had to, to make you realize and learn from these observations? Absolutely. Um, yeah, again, I don't want to give too much away here, but basically I came into COPS and the community was moving very fast. And obviously, if, if you've ever watched the Kubernetes community, the whole Kubernetes community moves very fast. And we started, we started working and developing. And as I started going through this iteration cycle as a developer, um, I started to kind of notice that things were getting noisy, for lack of a better term, um, and started to kind of reevaluate the code. And then me and, and the rest of the COPS maintainer team kind of got together and and started to go through this exercise of evaluating the code and figuring out what what could be better and what was really going on here. And I, I really think it was like a classic case of we 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 went through and we we coded it with like I believe you were saying something about best intentions, right? Like we were going through and trying to create a, an environment that would be easy for us to scale and change later. So we had abstraction, we had interfaces in place, we we had put a lot of work into sort of making this thing scalable. And actually, in the long run, a lot of that stuff kind of came in and, and ended up getting in our way. And we, we, we slimmed it down and became much more expressive with our code. And that ultimately made a much quicker developer cycle. And um, to kind of go into the developer empathy side of things here, it actually was like got other maintainers and other contributors excited and involved in the project. And what was that effort like? Like, how long did it take to refactor this code base from, uh, you know, this this crazy kind of unwieldy thing that you kind of alluding to into kind of something you're more proud of now? So the the timeline was super quick. It was it was about three weeks. Um, we were trying to make a release. I think I want to say one five four. I have it. I have it in my deck. Um, and and the, the thing is, is in the cops community, we usually try to do a release right after Kubernetes. So Kubernetes releases n. Uh, one to two weeks later, we want to have support in COPS for version N as well. So as we're sort of scrambling to get this done, we started to go through and realize, you know, and, and look at the code and realize like, oh, maybe maybe this is a lot of effort and a lot of code here to just solve one simple problem. And maybe we can take this whole giant bundle of, of Go code out and replace it with like a handful of really expressive functions. Uh-oh. Is danger, Will wrong. Robinson. Danger. Danger. What is that? It sounds like a, a weather warning. I, I think we I think we just got an amber alert here in Colorado. Uh, and that uh, was my that was my okay Google box on, on the shelf behind me. And that would actually make sense because you can't mute those things. Yep. So uh, cops, we understand now. Can we talk about draft? Because I think draft has probably more impact on your day-to-day your -day Go developer than COPS does. What what's what's the story with draft? It's it's there's so much hype. Like draft is going to change everything, but I haven't sat down and tried it yet. What's what's draft going to do to make my life easier? Again, I think this is moving into the the developer empathy and operational empathy space. Uh, draft makes it really easy um, as a developer to get get an, an application that you're working on locally running in your Kubernetes cluster with relatively low overhead. So I guess sort of the story behind it would be you, you have a draft daemon that, that's running and it's watching a directory for deltas. Um, as it detects a delta, you, you make a, a change, like add a new line and save the file or something. It will, it'll detect that and then it'll uh, go through this like rebuilding and redeployment cycle where it'll, it'll bundle up your application into a container, push it to a registry, and then use Helm, that's sort of like behind the scenes of what's going on in draft to actually make a deployment in Kubernetes and run that in Kubernetes. Oh, wow. So I, I used to work on, on Scala, and, and this tool reminds me of SBT quite a bit with this sort of you run it and it sits there. And as soon as you make a change, it'll sort of recompile is what it did in Scala. But uh, for draft, that sort of recompiling is actually a build stage where it'll actually compile your code if, if you're writing Go or if, if you're writing an interpretive language, it'll just stick it in a container and then push that out to the cluster, which is pretty handy because if you've ever developed for Kubernetes, you know there's like, I, I have this, this alias in my bash profile that I'm certainly not proud of, <laughs> where it would do all the stuff that I just talked about and it was kind of hacky and, and this is a much more elegant way of doing that. Yeah, everybody has that same nasty bash script if they're working in Kubernetes. So that does, it's, it almost sounds like a, a Heroku for Kubernetes sort of thing. 
yeah. simplifying the whole development workflow. That sounds cool. So does it use a concept of build packs or something similar to, to determine how to containerize the application? Or do you still have to provide guidance on the containerization of your app? Um, so there, there is build packs. Um, I think right now we support six or seven languages. And those are, those are built into the code base. I know we plan on growing those over time. That's really cool. I'm looking through the docs now to see what the, the list of those six is. I don't see it yet, but I'm sure it's there somewhere. That's really awesome. Okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a draft sold person. I'm going to have to go play with it. So I think uh, part of the, there was there was an article. Um, I forget who posted the article from the Microsoft team when draft was released. Um, but that listed the languages, I think. I was trying to look it up real quick. Um, it's, that, there's a directory in draft. Let me see if I can't pull it up. And then in addition to that, I think that um, this, how does this work as far as like, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, uh, sharing the cluster with, with production systems for like multi-tenancy, you know, multiple developers leveraging the same Kubernetes cluster. Um, does the, does your application as it's being built out in draft, is that in its own namespace or are you kind of sharing the cluster with the rest of the world? How's that work? So there's a, there's a command draft init that will, um, you specify the namespace you want to run in. And as long as, as two people are using different namespaces, they're not going to conflict. Okay. Nice. That's really cool. So is, is this type of stuff mostly what you're working on at Microsoft or um, what other things is, are you responsible for? Are, you said you're working on the Azure team, right? Right. Um, so right now I'm working on some internal projects that are sort of like behind the scenes that we're going to announce later once it's, they're a little more fleshed out. But it's, it's basically I'm, I'm on the ACS team and building out bigger, badder, more awesome Kubernetes functionality for Azure users. Well. So is, is there a particular part of Kubernetes that you prefer to work on or that you find yourself mostly working on? Because I think the thing we all find is there's so many components that it's really hard to be aware of all of them, you know, the scheduler and the networking components and storage. And, you know, there's just a lot of different moving parts. And as you said earlier, like the, it moves so fast. It, it does. I think. I mean, to, to put it into perspective, when I first joined the Deus now Microsoft team, I had never really even interacted with a cluster past the API. So my entire Kubernetes career up until January of this year was bootstrapping and, and digging through kubelet logs and understanding how all the, the components of the control plane fit together. And once the API was up and running and I could send, send an HTTPS request to it, I was sort of where I stopped. Um, and I think I still kind of naturally go into that space of sort of the underlying bootstrapping and how is the system working behind the scenes and what does the cube system namespace look like and uh, making sure that's all happy and healthy. And then of course, how, how does the infrastructure underneath that fit in that whole orchestration bit? Kind of like the, the provisioning aspect and then kind of how all the components uh, communicate between themselves and not so much the application layer, right. if, if I'm understanding that right. Yeah. So if you had plenty of free time, is there an area that you would love to dig into deeper? Uh, I, I think I really would like to get into building out new applications in Kubernetes. So I've, I've kind of always like gone through this exercise of getting Kubernetes up and running, dealing with the infrastructure, solving those like networking and network overlay problems. And I've never actually had like the, the joy of I'm going to write an app, I'm going to stick it in a container, and I'm going to go run it in production in Kubernetes. Like that's, I've always watched other people <laughs> do that, and it's always so fun and exciting. And so like, I'm secretly kind of like, one of these days, I'm going to move my blog over on like a weekend or something like that. Um, but indirectly, you've helped everybody launch their stuff, right? Right. So, so yeah, there's a lot of value in that. But I think there's, it's always fun looking at stuff. And I look at like uh, Jesse Frizzell too, and it's like, she put what in the container? <laughs> yeah, we were actually, we did a Helm hack night in San Francisco last week, and uh, I might have had one too many beers, but I thought it would be a good idea to try to run IE6 in a container, um, <laughs> just because some, some of the stuff we're dealing with here at Microsoft requires IE. And so I was like, hey, if I have a Docker file for that, that'll make it much easier. So I started going through the exercise, and it's actually, it's actually pretty fun containerizing odd things. Like I had a good time and 
And once it's done, it's kind of like done forever and you don't really have to deal with it anymore. So it's kind of like you give yourself these neat little Lego blocks. But we got to know how deep was that, was that rabbit hole for IE6? It really wasn't that bad at all. It was, it was really no different than getting IE6 running like in Wine on Linux. So that's how you, you did it in Wine? Yep. In Docker? Yep. That makes sense. Actually, that, that um, sparks some ideas too. So like one of the programs that I like using or always like using on my Mac is Navicat. Like I like having like a consistent UI for database stuff. So I naturally thought on my Linux machine, they have Navicat for Linux, except it's just the Windows version in Wine. So then you got to have all the 32-bit libraries and all that junk. So running that in a container would be awesome. Yeah. It would. My contribution to the world. <laughs> I think it was cool for me because containers always were kind of like this mystery. And then you and then you kind of realize like there's there's a lot going on, but at the end of the day, like we're hitting your kernel. So whatever we would be sending to the kernel in real life, quote unquote, um, you're gonna you're gonna get pretty close to the same functionality coming from a container. And it was like, oh, this is sort of not this black mystery space anymore. I kind of get it now. Um, and I think actually seeing like the X server get started and like actually bring something up on my on my screen was kind of like that aha moment. <laughs> I think there's difficulty in adoption of containers, though, too, because explaining the differences, you know, I, I forget who it was, whether it was Brendan Gregg or somebody I was reading kind of like a performance article where he basically said that uh, most of his day is in uh, spent exonerating the container that most people want to, oh, this isn't performing right, you know, that it's, it's, uh, it's got to be because it's in a container and things like that. And you start to realize, like, there's, there's not a lot of um, magic there, that it's all operating system things being called. It's not the container. It's the configuration the container is getting, right? Right. But people, um, I guess the natural um, assumption is that it's a lot closer to a virtual machine and that there's a, a bigger layer of abstraction there. But it's really not. I mean, it's just like a, a container, you know, at the end of the day, it's just you're change rooting into something and, and that's it. Yeah, that's basically what I tell people is that it's a lot closer to just a highly configured process than it is a VM. Yeah. So you guys were just acquired, you guys being Deus by Microsoft. Tell us about the, uh, the culture change there. Deus was a, a nice startup in, in the Boulder, Denver area, and then you went off to, um, Engine Yard, and now Microsoft. So that's that's a big two two big changes in two years. What's the culture like at Microsoft? How do Microsofties think about Go and and containers in general? What's what's that feel like? I I was so impressed and fell in love so quickly because I I was kind of worried like like am I going to still be able to write Go? What is this going to look like? And I think after the first day of exploring like the like slash Azure on GitHub and going through the code like. Microsoft loves Linux. Like we love Go and the culture is, it's great. I still feel like I work at a startup. I go to work with my best friends every day. We go out to eat lunch. Like life's good. Wow. It's really interesting to see the love for, for Linux coming out of Microsoft uh, in recent years. I mean, they're making Bash run on Windows too. I mean. I love it. And it's so cool. Like I, I feel almost a sense of pride to be like a part of that. Because, you know, coming from like a world where like Microsoft was always sort of different and Windows was always sort of different to be like, hey, we're gonna build out these really awesome products in like this really great cloud using Unix, using Linux, using Go and, and making these awesome technical decisions is, is really exciting. That's so awesome. So how about free time? What do you, what do you like to do in your free time? Uh... We, we, we know some stuff from the band thing. <laughs> you, you got quite the collection of instruments. I do. I play a lot of music. Um, I have a whole basement filled with, with instruments. And we're actually, we're moving next, next week. So they're all in boxes right now. So I'm having like guitar withdrawal. Oh, man. And I think my guitar withdrawal has passed. Now it's just a, it's a decoration for my office. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those ghost pains. I just put my whole band room back together because I, had, I put hardwood in over the last month. and. So now all the hardwood's done, and I put the whole band back together last night and plugged in my amp for the first time at 10 p.m. and went a little bit crazy on channel three, and it was really, it was awesome. It felt so good. 
Carlicia, do you play any instruments? No, I don't. Uh, I played I played piano for a couple of years when I was let's say I don't even remember. Maybe I was nine, but I don't remember thing. I, I remember how to position the fingers. That's it. I think uh, I think in order for me to say that I play the guitar, we would have to clearly define what the definition <laughs> of play is. <laughs> <laughs> I might be taking ukulele soon. Oh, ukulele is so much fun. Yeah. yeah. That's such a cool instrument. I don't know. I think the guitar is a pretty cool instrument, though, too. <laughs> it's one of those things, like, to to see somebody who knows how to play it is awesome. It's, uh, I, I played synth in a, in a band for a number of years, and, and that sort of, like, went anywhere from, like, weighted key piano to playing, uh, like, organ to actually having, like, the super teeny tiny micro chord with the little itty bitty keys on it. And guitar, like, it's it's such a unique instrument because you have to kind of have one hand that's doing piano things, and then your left hand is on that, like, slide bar where you can get, like, the modulation and the pitch bend and everything. Um, so it, it took a while to kind of get, like, into this, like, I'm holding it like a guitar, playing it like a piano, and my other hand is doing guitar things. Um, <laughs> but it was like, I, I bought it, and then the first thing I had to learn how to play was Frankenstein by the Edgar Winter Group. And I just, like... <laughs> I played that for like six months straight. I'm pretty sure the neighbors were like, if I hear that riff one more time. <laughs> Somebody's going to have to die. Yeah. Uh, I, I just pasted a, a YouTube search result for Jordan Rudess's key guitar solos into the Slack. And I, I saw him live. Well, I've seen him live several times, but one of them, he did like this nine minute epic guitar thing. And it just changed my idea of guitars forever. Very awesome. I will check that out. So I think by the time this episode uh, is released, we will be in our 30-day window to the conference. You, uh, you well prepared? Are you sitting back, relaxing, rehearsing, or still racing and doing last-minute changes? I, I've had my deck done for a while. Um, I, I gave the the talk about a month ago. I gave like the shortened, condensed version of it for an internal thing at a company. Uh, so I think I'm ready. Like I'm probably as we get closer to the conference, I'm gonna get a little more like, oh man, I want to make sure that this thing is perfect and on point. But I'm just excited. Like this will be my first Gopher Con, and I'm speaking there, so that's pretty rad. Oh, you haven't attended yet? Nope. Ah, oh, newbie. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be awesome. And Brian, we we found the we found the one person who doesn't procrastinate. There, I know, there right? Exists I, was just, one. I was just thinking, wow, it's this person has their of. talk done ahead of time usually we spend the night before each next day in moving between hotel rooms helping people finish their talks last year yeah. i i don't even know if we got to sleep the night before each day because it was just moving from one hotel room to the next uh, listening to people's talks fixing their slides you know it was lots of procrastination so we're very proud of you chris thanks it, it does big. keep it does keep changing. I will say that like the, the story kind of like, it's like a fish story. It gets more dramatic every time I tell it, but as, <laughs> as Kubernetes grows and as I learn more and as I kind of, you know, go deeper in the rabbit hole, I'm like, Oh, this might be another like interesting tidbit to throw in there. So I think I'm probably on my like fifth or sixth revision of it. Uh, evolution is okay, but not having it done the day you show up <laughs> to the conference, not so okay. Yeah. There are those beautiful people who can just get up on stage and totally wing something, though. And uh, I, I can only be in awe. <laughs> like, you know who's really good at that? This is totally random, but Charlie Nutter, the guy who manages, does most of the J Ruby stuff. Mm -hmm. He can he can show up at any conference and you just give him a topic and he'll riff an entire hour long talk flawlessly with live code. Wow! 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 That's yeah. like rock, that's like rock climbing without a rope. Yeah, that's pretty much what I say. Wow. Uh, it's awesome. If you've ever seen it, it's it's impressive. So um, do you guys want to talk about anything uh, project news-wise? I think uh, we have probably like 15 minutes or so left in the show. There are a lot of interesting projects that, that have been updated lately, and there's some news. Let, let's dive into it. I'll start with uh, GoPlay. Holy cow, is that cool. So you guys know I've had this... Uh, I don't know if obsession is the right word, but I've been trying very hard to learn front end development and I'm an old dog and it's a new trick. It's not going terribly well. And I've, I've had this, this conception that 
using Gopher.js would make my life easier, uh, for better or worse. I don't know if that's true. But there's a, a front-end framework called Vecti that's built on Gopher.js, and it's very much in the style of, of React in that you know you build components and reuse them and such. Uh, but Vecti isn't terribly well documented yet because it's still kind of in flux. And somebody built a Go Playground-like thing called uh, goplay.space. So if you go to HTTPS goplay.space, um, it's a Go Playground front end. And there's also a back end that submits your uh, code off to the playground and then reformats it. But it's nice because it's got some slick um, integration with like GoDoc. So you can highlight something and, and on the right side of the, the window, it will open up the GoDoc for that stuff. So I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, this giant code base, giant maybe isn't quite the right word, but a, a large enough code base that uh, gives a great example of VECD and client and server side Go. You know, it's just a really neat project. And, and the tool itself, GoPlay.space, is, is just like the playground, but better. So it's a neat tool. Yeah, I was looking at this. Um, it, I saw this on Reddit the other day. I, I do actually try to keep up with our Golang as a moderator from time to time. But uh, I, I saw this when you were able to click on, on like the, the Go functions and it would pull up the Go docs right there on the right. It yeah, was isn't like, that neat? Uh, yeah, like I'm going to use this all the time um, whenever I'm demoing stuff at the office, just because we have a lot of people who look at it who like may not be super involved with Go. And having the docs right there as you're going through the code is going to be invaluable. Yeah. So now, is this something that you host? Like, I haven't looked at this yet. Is this something that you host yourself or is it just like an alternative? play site that you can go to so it, it actually uses the playground in the background um, but you if you wanted to host your own you could but you don't need to because he's got one hosted at goplay.space oh cool i'm gonna have to start using that yeah it's, it's really slick and there's lots of extra you know kind of sugary features on top of the playground that make it neat Oh, no way. I, so I just uh, was playing around. <laughs> no way! <laughs> I, I, had, I had to open this up because you guys are talking about it. So on top of clicking on a function, like you can just go to the import statement and click the imported package, and it brings up the package docs, too. Yeah. Yeah. Slick. That's why I want to go uh, enjoy this source code. I need to assume or subsume it all, read it. Become it, learn it, do it. No way. All right. <laughs> oh, this so is cool. It, Shut the front door. Yeah, if you click on the word package or the word import or the word funk, it actually brings up the doc for like the package clause and and import declarations and function declarations, like the actual docs for that in the language spec. Like that's sweet. You, pretty cool. Yeah. Also, just because we're all hackers here, there's a settings button in the upper right, and you can change it over to dark mode, and it looks really legit. Nice. nice. Oh, it is legit. Thank you for that. Legit. Yeah. And for if for anybody who doesn't <laughs> like the, the standard, you can change your tab width, too. <laughs> I like 8 a lot. I don't know why, but I like 8 a lot. This is This is so slick. It's slick, isn't it? I was really excited. The uh, the person that released it, hang on, let me get the name because I was just looking at it a moment ago. It is um, Igor Afanasyev. 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 I'm, I'm not sure. Igor. But Igor's Igor's been talking about it in the Vecti uh, room in the Golang Slack for a long time, and finally released the source a couple days ago. So really cool to see a, a implementation of something large in Vecti. So there's Gopher.js on the front end, straight Go on the back end. Cool stuff. Now I, now I need to try to avoid playing with this. I just want to type <laughs> random <laughs> random code in here to see what happens. Right? Like if I, if I use a channel and I click on the, the pointer thing, does it do something? Does it, <laughs> I'm going to be finding hidden things now. Right, like now I'm going to find parts of the the Golang documentation that I haven't looked at before that I'm now going to start reading. You almost feel obligated to read it after it pops up. <laughs> right. So the CFP for Gotham Go, which is in New York City in October 5th and 6th, 
it's open and uh, so the CFP is open and it will close on July 15. So which is uh, roughly I think the last day ago for con. Yes. I, I'm yeah. thinking today's June. So, Today yeah, is so June. It is June. Oh, no, I'm saying I was thinking today is, is July. I'm thinking like, wow, that's only a week away that it closes, but no, it's like a month and a week. This is how so. you can tell we're really close to GopherCon because we don't know what day it is. We don't know what time it is. We don't really even know what month it is. And we certainly couldn't tell you who the members of our family are. <laughs> we have families? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and um, the last thing I'll mention for projects and news is that the videos from GopherCon China are online. And uh, apparently most of them are in Chinese. Oh, that's cool. It is. So let's practice on Mandarin by watching the videos. I want to learn Mandarin so badly. I tried. And with that, I have to go. Up, oh, you're getting kicked out of your room? I see people look far away. <laughs> They're going away. They're going away. I'm not being kicked out just yet. Good. Crisis just, averted. Yeah, flip him the bird. So listen fastly. <laughs> we got stuff to do here. This is go time. <laughs> oh, see if that works. Let you're me know. Get people in trouble, Brian. I try. I told you I was feeling a little spicy today. So, um, uh, go Vim one thirteen or one dot. Vim go, or yes, Vim go rather. Vim go. Um, was just released too. I was looking at the release notes. There's some really nice stuff in there. Yeah, one of the cool things was the um, what is it called, Keyify. So yes. if you, if you have like a struct or struct literal and you didn't actually put the field names on there. It'll automatically yeah, look it up and do it for you. That is really awesome. Wait, so if you if you define a struct literal, it'll put the it'll define the members automatically for you. Yeah. So yes. if you've used a, an anonymous struct literal or you know a struct literal without the okay. key names, I have to type... go. Sorry, I have to go now. Bye, it was great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So yeah, you've got a a struct literal where you didn't put the key names in and you just uh, counted on ordering to manage the assignment. Uh, you can type go keyify in Vim Go and it will put the key names in for you. Which is cool because that's a, a GoLint big red flag for key names. So it's kind of slick. And there's a bunch of other stuff in this release. It also allows you to be lazy though, because you can just like type really <laughs> fast out the values and then just do go keyify and let it fill in the fields for you. Oh, that would be cool. I mean, I mean, if you remember it, that tends to be my problem is there's lots of cool things. I just never remember to use them when they're useful. I remember them after the fact. So I came across this cool project this week, too, called F-SQL. And now that you're talking about flipping birds, Brian, it has like a whole <laughs> new meaning to me. <laughs> but it's a file system SQL. So you can run basically like SQL commands uh, uh, to search so rather than just using like a find command and all its flags, you can actually do like a, you know, select star from and like do name of file like such and such. Oh, wow. And check, and check the size. I was curious. I, I saw that too. And I was wondering if you could like do a join, like if you could like take files from this directory and like match them on files from that directory and, and show how they relate. Which would be useful if you're ever doing um, like nested vendor and you want to figure out which packages need to go where. You can use and or or to join conditions. Yeah, but you can't do you can't. I don't join know if you can queries. have multiple select. Yeah, a union would be killer, wouldn't it? Yeah. Do some crazy stuff with a, a SQL union. I'll bet you they'd take a pull request though. Well, you know, <laughs> with a little bit of uh, Linux command line, you could do that though. Yeah, you could. So you use F SQL and then throw in some awk and sed and grep and all of the rest of it. But of course, that defeats the whole purpose of having F SQL. So I'll be quiet now. So I think, um, yeah, other than that, I don't know whether is there any, any other news or things going on you guys want to talk about before we wrap this thing up? Well, we have our free software Friday we can't forget. Yeah. And I have a cool one too. You it do? Needs, it needs some, yeah, it needs some code love, but. Uh, it's Kubernetes related. I'll go first, being at it, that I'm hinting at it anyway. Okay. So um, we have like a thing we're working on where we're, we're needing to support multiple interfaces inside of a container. 
um, basically one would be the mesh network like flannel or something and then the other being uh, like a VLAN interface for outbound video data but anyway so we're having to build like our own CNI plugin to manage this and I came across this project called CNI Genie um, which is actually ridiculously cool um, it's, it looks like it's still in its really like its infancy but basically you can add a CNI annotation to a pod and then comma separate a list of CNI plugins you want to run so you, that you can get multiple interfaces. So you can have like flannel and calico and all these things like running in the same cluster and then issue um, IPs oh. from specific ones or multiples. And then on top of that, it does some metrics collection through like C Advisor, where if you want it to, it can choose um, what interface it should give you. Or which oh, CNI wow. plugin it should use, you know, based, based on, on usage. Network performance? Yeah. That's crazy. So, so first yeah. of all, CNI is complicated enough without adding comma separated list of CNI plugins to make my life more more crazy. <laughs> so God bless them for going there, but holy cow. But the so the the other interesting <laughs> thing about this though too is is a lot of people um implement these networks at the Docker layer and things like that. The cool thing about this is, is it would allow you to run multiple. So in like a multi-tenancy uh, environment where people might have uh, different requirements, mm -hmm. you could host multiple applications within that network and then have different uh, CNI plugins that manage that, especially when you get into kind of like um, access control and, and things like that. But yeah, so. That's crazy cool. And the other cool thing is, is like if you need to migrate, right? Like you could have a flannel network running and all your current containers running on flannel and then you stand up Calico side by side and then you're just kind of rotating out um, containers over onto that to that new CNI plugin and new network interface. So there's a thought there too. That's nuts. Yeah. Crazy cool. And I see that it's from Huawei and I know after talking to some people who went to GopherCon China that they are doing gigantic things with Go. Huawei. So uh, cool to see them releasing open source and hope that we can find more ways to have that language barrier a little easier for all of us to to see the things they're doing and, and collaborate. I know the Go community in China is huge, but it's kind of tough since I don't speak Chinese. If I could just learn Chinese, it would be so much easier. I tried. Uh, this is, wow, almost 10 years ago now. I, I tried to do some uh, Rosetta Stone for for Mandarin. Well, that's awesome. I didn't make it very far. All right. So my free software Friday shout out is to a person, not a project. Uh, everybody has probably seen this person in the Gopher Slack on uh, GitHub, on uh, Twitter. Uh, this is Florent Patan. And I hope I didn't butcher your name terribly, Florent. I apologize if I did. But uh, Florent is just an incredibly active member of the community and always always there to answer questions and help people out. Um, very much appreciate all of the work he does for the communities. He's one of the one of the cornerstones of the you know the helper crew in Go. And it's awesome to see all the time he dedicates to helping people on on Slack, on Reddit, on Twitter, or everywhere. So thank you so much for all that you do, Florin. We appreciate it. Chris, is there any project or any person you wanted to shout out for uh, Free Software Friday? Yeah, I would say the one person in the Go community who has stuck out to me more in the past few months than anybody else is Carolyn Van Slick. Um, I noticed nice. her doing some work in GoDep with, with Sam and, and that whole effort and just the code that they're cranking out and, and the effort and the time they're putting in, uh, just being super proficient and really stood out to me. So I would like to say thank you for all you're doing to her. And she actually gave a talk at uh, last year's GopherCon. A great talk about adding adding more users to your app by supporting Windows better. Awesome. I can get on board with that. Exactly. Since I'm sitting in front of a Windows machine. I'm just I'm just thinking of our, our fifteen minutes. <laughs> <start. laughs> uh, how, how long you it go... took me to get Skype working? Yeah. Well, no, okay. just, just how quickly you go from uh, frustration with your your computer to uh admiration well i actually so so since since we've got a few minutes left let me tell you about my little recent migration so 
everybody knows I, I just can't find an operating system I love. This is not news to anybody, but I've been pushing myself more and more into the Microsoft world lately because I think the Windows subsystem for Linux is the answer to most of the problems that I have. It may not may not be everybody else's answers, but you know, I want a Linux development environment and I don't want to sit at Linux daily because you know, email's terrible. Lots of things are not so great about desktop Linux. But development on Linux is what I want. So I thought WSL is probably the way to go. And with the latest updates, I'm running um I'm running the Fast Ring Insider release. So I'm on build uh, 16.199. So it's a it's a very fresh release. Uh, there pretty much isn't anything in WSL that doesn't work flawlessly. I can't can't find anything that doesn't work perfectly in WSL, which means that I've got a uh, Linux development environment and it's it's perfect. Now I just have to get used to the Windows part and I'm doing pretty well. I mean, I've always liked Windows email. Uh, I just have a hard time with things like keyboard shortcuts and, and such. But the, the thing that killed me today was that Skype doesn't recognize my, well, actually it does. It, even worse, Skype recognizes my external audio interface for the podcast. It just doesn't pick up the microphone. <laughs> so, so I've got the little, the, the, the green light shows up that I'm talking in the audio interface. And in Windows Control Panel, I've got little green lights showing up, but it says I have inbound audio in my recording thing. But Skype is like, nope, no microphone. Thanks for playing. That's odd. So I, I blame Skype less than or more than I blame Windows because it works everywhere else. So because we haven't started a war yet, uh, Chris, what's your, <laughs> what's your development uh, operating system and editor of choice? Uh, and this is where this is the part of the show where everybody hangs up on me. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I run Arch Linux and Emacs most of the time. I'm I'm an Arch Linux and Vim person, so. And and this is uh I've been actually wanting to, to switch over to Vim. I know it, like it's you know oh my gosh Emacs for life, um but but the more I, I see it and the more I hear about the community and how fast we're coming out with things like like what we just talked about with the strict literals, um I think that it might be like a fun like dedicate a year to just switching over and just learning Vim and and seeing how I like it might be something fun to do. Yeah, once you get the the first set of key movements down, that's usually the hardest part. And then after that, it's just a lifetime of learning new tricks, you know, and being around other Vim people. And they see you type four characters and they're like, you know, you can do that in two, right? And you've learned something new. And oh, I, I just yeah. like using, using Vim in front of an audience of 20 or 30 people that, that may or may not know Vim, <laughs> that is probably the most painful thing in the world you can do. Because at the end of the class, people are like, you know, you could have done X, Y, Z and Vim and done this a lot faster. All right, fine. Just get off my back. Yeah. I do not, I do not need you criticizing my Vim motions. Well, you used to criticize my Vim motions. So I have the, never <laughs> criticized your Vim motions. You're, you're the Vim god. I know nothing about Vim compared to you. The history of mine and Brian's uh, <laughs> friendship and relationship. Actually, he, he was my boss for, for a while. Um, and yeah, he used to give me a hard time because I'd fly through stuff demoing. So I'd just be like changing tabs and jumping around the file and things like, like, like slow, slow down. down. <laughs> Can't even see what you're doing. You're moving so fast. And that was, that was actually what convinced me that Vim is a good place for me to go. Cause I used like sublime text and TextMate before that, but watching yeah. Eric fly through Vim, I was like, oh man, I got to get some of that. And that's exactly what it was like for me is I've, I've sat with some people who do the same thing. And I'm like, if I, if I could actually go through and learn that, I, I can see myself getting like obsessed with it. Like I have to learn more. I have to be able to do this in one less keystroke. And I just, mm -hmm. I just, I grew up with Emacs. It's like what the cool kids in high school used. And like, we used to play games on it. And so like, for me, it's just second nature. I don't have to think about it anymore. So maybe learn, it's time for me to learn a new text editor. And I'll, I'll actually plug a book for anybody um, interested in learning Vim. Um, I had used Vim for probably close to 10 years before um, I read this book. Uh, is Practical Vim by Drew Neal. Um, I learned a ton from that book that I didn't know from 10 years of using Vim. It kind of uh, teaches you to kind of look at the keystrokes in kind of, you know, the, the multiplier, the, the command, and kind of like a motion activity. And you start to realize that there's, a format to them, you know, like uh, C is for change, D is for delete, and then you have a motion, which is like T, you know, and then you can say like semicolon. So 
DT semicolon means delete up to the semicolon. CT, you know, is changed to the semicolon. And you kind of like, once you start recognizing those things, DW is delete word, you know, um, once you start recognizing those patterns, it, it becomes much easier to remember them all. Interesting. There's a cheat sheet somewhere too, um, like a poster. I remember it's my desktop. It's, really... <laughs> it's, it's literally my desktop because for some reason, once I got good enough to open files, move around, I stopped learning all Vim things. It's like, yeah, I can open files, I can edit. So I don't use very many motions and I don't use many of the extras. I know how to search and replace you know, and I know how to move to begin and insert and all that stuff. I, I, I'm a basic Vim user and I keep trying to convince myself that I need to learn all of the cool stuff and you know I can get everything done without learning it so I don't yeah lazy uh there's actually a follow-up book to that too called modern vim which gets into nvim and things like that I've not read that one yet and it's not out yet I don't think it's uh still being written but that'll be interesting when it comes out too because nvim is really cool too <laughs> nice <laughs> she's Scott Mansfield just posted a upside down t-shirt with vim commands on it <laughs> nice vim, vim cheat sheet that's fantastic i need that Thank shirt you, <laughs> yeah and I, I feel like that's something i feel like you see that a lot with vim is people like, like you like you said earlier you know it's a lifetime of learning how to be better at it like people who use vim i notice like grow and get better and like the longer they use it like the more they fall in love with it and the more they sort of learn to master it um and i guess for me like i don't really ever spend any part of my day-to-day -day coding life improving my editor skills like i can like jump to a word jump to a line save and exit and i kind of stop there mm -hmm. hmm. that's me i can do the basic stuff i've never really learned now today uh, uh, since we're on editors and kind of going sideways i did the uh, free webinar for JetBrains on gogland ide and i was blown away because i did that with florin and i was blown away by how many cool features are in gogland so if you haven't given Gogland a try yet, holy cow, do they have some really awesome Go stuff. We barely scratched the surface of the things that the IDE does, and it's, it's really cool how, how well Gogland thought through all of the, the Go stuff. So when you're, you know, when you're looking at text editors, obviously there's a huge difference between the, the weight, the heaviness of Vim and something like Gogland. But I've been using Gogland more and more lately, and... I'm impressed by just how much it does. If I'm on my Mac, I use Gogland exclusively. Um, and I'll run Emacs if I'm like at home on my Arch Linux box. Um, and it's it's great. I remember coming over from IntelliJ with like the Go plugin, getting the Kubernetes code base to index was like this like 20 minute process. <laughs> like, like I think it was like seven and a half gigabytes of memory or something. And Gogland did it in like like less than 20 seconds and running less than a gig. So, I mean, wow. it's, it's highly optimized for Go, and um, it works great. I use it for demos, and I code in it all the time. Now, one of the things we were talking about with indexing speed today, if you have uh, JavaScript mixed into your Go path with Go code, the indexing is significantly longer, which is uh, part of my problem, because I've got this gigantic Go path, but I put all of my code in my Go path. I just figured Go path is a great place to put all code. So that's why my indexing takes longer than most is because I have all these projects with JavaScript stuff and it's indexing those too for all of its code IntelliSense stuff. So I have a question, um, open, open question for the gang here. I, I run, I have multiple Go paths in my home directory for like different, different modes of writing Go that I'm in. And then I just change my Go, Go path variable based on like if I'm in Kubernetes mode or if I'm in Azure mode. Am I the mm -hmm. only one who does that or? Not at all. Okay. I do it. I do it by project most times. In fact, uh, all of my classroom material for teaching Go is a self-contained Go path, and then I've got Go paths for my personal projects. And if I have a, a job, which you know sometimes I do, then I'll have a Go path specifically for that, just to keep everything clean. And um, if if you're not already aware of this, I will I'll up your um, different environment game. There's a project called DirEnv that I use the crap out of. Mm -hmm. And basically, it allows you when you CD into a directory, it can execute shell scripts or set up aliases or um, your paths specifically for that directory. So I have I have these things set up these different go paths and things, but it just automatically changes for me when I go into the directory. 
I was literally thinking about writing this exact tool like two days ago. Yeah, I use Durem for everything. So all I have to do is change into the directory and it automatically changes my go path, exports, you know, the Docker variables for Postgres, whatever. Uh, I, I And it was Eric, I'm sure, that introduced me to Durem or maybe its predecessor because Durem is written in Go, but there was another one before that that isn't. Same thing, though. You, you have an ENVRC file and it just automatically sources that when you change into the directory to change your Go path to set environment variables. Awesome. Yeah, so much fun. I use it to change out like um, my my kube control uh, configs and things like that too. So you're, I don't not, have you're, to... you're not using kube CTX yet. I say so. I usually I usually either say kube control or kube CTL. I, I haven't gotten into the kube cuddle thing. No, I'm <laughs> or... kube CTX. There's there's a new app called kube CTX that um, allows it's it's almost like Durham, but it allows you to change your context for kube control. And you could just type, you know, kubectx work and get a new profile. Awesome, because right now I am using the good old have a bunch of kube configs in my directory and then I sublink them according to what I'm doing. So this oh, sounds no, awesome. no, 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 no. Oh, I'll, yeah, paste, no. I'll paste this one into Slack. It's awesome. We well, were using even, this last week when I was at training and it's so much nicer. Even with Durham, though, too, you can have it execute shell commands and stuff for you. So you can have it just change your context when you CD into the directory. Yeah, so I just put the link to that in uh, uh, Slack. It's uh, github.com slash A-H-M-E-T-B slash K-U-B-E-C-T-X. I feel like we need to have an episode all the time where we share tools with each the, other. The tools episode? Heck yeah, I think that'd be an awesome episode. All of the cool things that we each put into the automation of our workspaces and make our lives easy. That'd be fun. Yeah, and then and then we could create this gigantic, super duper repository of the best ways to um, automate your entire workflow. And at the end of the day, you wouldn't even have to write code; you just show up and click a button. The code would self write, and we just watch the compilers work. Awesome! I, I finally just cracked down, and I started pushing my entire home directory up to a Git repo. What? Yeah, the whole thing. I, I'm crazy. Well, I like I get ignored like downloads and stuff like that, like the big directories that have all like my junk on it on like my MacBook or my Arch Linux box. But oh, like uh, documents too. Yeah, dot files, documents. I just get it all up there, and then I can just pull them down whenever I need them and edit them and push oh, them back up. Wow, that's brave. Yeah, I also run my own Git server, so. <laughs> I have a lot of um, my dot files too publicly although i don't think i've updated them in a long time i need i need to like just wipe stuff and start over and using the stow tool will make that really easy too there's another one um it's not rcs but um shoot i yeah, just saw it the was, other day something yeah, like rcs the, the name is like or somebody created yeah, one it, one of those ruby companies made a really cool um dot file configuration tool and i saw somebody so illithrar who's illithrar um name is escaping me on twitter illithrar darn it i'm blanking i don't usually blank on names anyway i'm gonna go look it up while, while you guys talk i'm gonna go look up his dot files yeah so some of those things are cool though um at silverlock but I, I guess i'm like an old school linux geek so stow just works so well for me just automatically sim links and binaries there, and it's super fast, and the package exists already. And... RCM. I said RCS, but it's RCM. I just, I have a bin directory that is just like eight years worth of hacky shell scripts that I, <laughs> add, that I add to path whenever I like move into a computer. And oh, some, you gotta sometimes... publish that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's private <laughs> right now. I'll pull my dot files out and I'll publish it for you guys. Thank um, you. I sometimes forget that they're not like on every system. And I'll be like, wait, you don't have this like KCXX27B command? <laughs> Doesn't everybody have that? Yeah. I used to do that with um, Git aliases. You know, and first I'd alias um, G to Git. And then I had actual um, aliases set up inside of um, Git too so that I could shorthand everything and I'd be on somebody else's computer or logged in, you know, over SSH somewhere and I'm trying to run my aliases and it's yelling at me that it's not a valid Git command. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, it is. <laughs> of course it is. I just typed my alias GX. 
and I have like a, an alias for um, viewing um, the Git log, where it's kind of like a tree where you can kind of see railroad tracks and things like that. And um, I just kind of have that alias. So it'll drive me nuts when I'm like on somebody else's machine and I try to get log and it shows up in like the standard way. And I'm like, whoa, wait, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the, the disadvantage to crafting like your own workspace and environment. But it's also one of the things that's so attractive about it, right? Like that's, yes. I love, I love Linux and I love being able to configure and make everything special just for me because I don't know, there's something that's sort of fun at the end of the day, knowing like, this is my secret command that nobody else runs. And most people will probably hate and disagree with, but it's mine. That's right. I, that's my yeah. favorite part. You're having your own bash aliases and shell scripts that do the crazy stuff, you know, that, that just makes me happy. They're fun to share too. Like I remember, I think it was you, Brian, the first time you saw um, in my in my shell prompt where I have like it changed the host name's color and put like oh, the yeah. the little lock there when it recognizes that. that I'm SSH'd in somewhere else because yep. I would constantly type a command that I thought I was running locally and I would run it on a remote system. So <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, wrote... I still use that, by the way, because I love it. <laughs> So awesome to and and I added I don't know I don't think you had it before but I added a a little icon that shows an Apple if I'm in a Mac and it shows a Penguin if I'm on a Linux machine and it has the the lock if it's SSH so if I don't see the lock Penguin I know I'm you know, on a different machine that's it's handy nice yeah it's okay. just kind of cool because it basically just changes my prompt to basically make it really I really know that I'm like a remote system and I pay attention better. Mm -hmm. So except for the fact that I tend to be like on my Mac promoted into my workstation. So I've become like accustomed to seeing it there. So now I feel like I need to to make it smarter. The difference between like machines that up. I own or are on my local network versus not. Well, that's a good idea. So and uh, one of the other things that um, I, I have, too, is uh, a helper to uh, be able to tab complete machines that I've SSH'd into before. Because it drives me too. nuts. It drives me so nuts having to like, you know, type out full IPs or trying to remember what they are, or host names. So I, I changed, um, what's, the, what's the new um, D menu replacement we're using in Arch now? What is that? Um, uh, oh, uh, start yeah. You know what I'm talking about. It's not D menu. It's the replacement. What, what the heck is it called? Rofi. Um, Rofi. Thank you. So I have a Rofi script that if I just hit or alt D in arch and just type a host name, it will automatically SSH to the host name. And I did oh, that cool. with some, some bash hackery. Love me some arch. And by the way, just because I'm running windows now does not mean I'm not running I3 anymore, <laughs> which I think is the best thing ever. I, there's, there's truly nothing better than I've got windows in the background. I open up WSL, I start an X server, and now I'm running i3. I have all the best of all worlds. What window manager do you use, Chris? Um, right now I am running XK, what is it? X... XFCE? Yeah, XSpace. I always, do you guys say XSpace? I don't, I I never don't think say I've that. heard of it before. Yeah, I've, I've seen it, but I've never said it, so I don't know. XFCE is what I would say. That's what I have now. I rarely actually get on my, my Arch Linux box. I'm usually just SSH'd into it. But I will. Uh, I ran GNOME for the longest time, and I think that's kind of like what I grew up with. But I'm just running this now because it was sort of the prettiest at the time. It's light, too. There's, there's yeah. not a lot of heaviness in XFCE. Yeah, I think pretty sure Eric was the one who introduced me to i3. And, and once you go i3, you cannot go back. You really can't. Well, it's, just, it's the best, best windowing environment ever. Oh, yeah. And just being able to quickly kind of like hotkey full screen stuff or as like a parent child relationship. So you can have like multiple windows set up and they're kind of uh, grouped into one container and you can just quickly kind of full screen those two things at once. And yeah, yeah. Just... it's awesome. If you like tiling in any way um, and keep shortcuts, because once you go into i3, you, know, you could just throw your mouse away. You don't need it. And that, that's brilliant for command line text editor people. Yeah, I think the only time I touch my mouse is when I'm in a browser. That's it. Links for life. Yeah. Just kidding. Browse the internet and links. 
<laughs> Wait, I'm sure Jesse Frizzell does. Ah, uh, we're not worth. If if we uh, if we if Lynx was the only thing there, uh, no more like browser compatibility issues with uh, CSS <laughs> and the way things look. <laughs> right. <laughs> no more Web 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how would you run a video? I guess you could see it or something. How, know, how would that work? What would YouTube look like in Lynx? How would you watch the video? I swear I've seen a Lynx plugin that will play videos. I could be wrong, but I swear I've seen one. There's a video player that will actually convert video real time. It'll like use in curses and actually do colored ASCII to like superimpose the video in your terminal. What? I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. trying to find this library right now. It's pretty cool. I've seen that, but I'm I swear there's a, a thing that will actually embed in links. And maybe I'm thinking of something else. I don't know. I I have to see the ASCII video conversion. Yeah, it is uh, ASCII-video. <laughs> it's a JavaScript package, of course. Of course. Uh, there you go. Nice. I'm going to have to play with this now. <laughs> I don't know. That means you have to use NPM. Just say no. Ah, oh, sweet. Like, I'm, I'm actually that looking at so that. That is so cool. Page. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Not going to lie. That's cool. This reminds me of the, did you guys ever see the, the Star Wars Telnet server? Yeah, very yeah. much, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I did see that. Can we release ASCII versions of all the GopherCon videos? <laughs> do you think yes. people would be mad? <laughs> Let's do. <laughs> Let's definitely do. I think it would have to be, like, in addition to the real videos. Yeah. I think we've gone twice as long as we normally go on an episode because yeah. we dived into the, the tool. Yeah, we're probably totally into the after show now. <laughs> yeah, we, we, so we should say goodbye so we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so we should say bye. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, huge thank you to Chris for coming on the show with us today. Um, thanks to Cargalicia, who, who wasn't able to continue, but uh, she's here in spirit right now. She'll be back next week. Thank you so much for coming on, Chris. It was an honor to finally talk in person to, well, not by person, but over the internet to my best friend. If you guys are aware, Chris and I are BFFs. We've, we've been BFFs for several months now, but yeah. we've declared it on Twitter, so. It's Twitter official. Yeah, we're Twitter BFFs. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. All right, that's it for this episode of Go Time. Tune in live on Thursdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us. In real time during the shows, head to changelog.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. Special thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. Also, Linode, we host everything we do on Linode servers. Head to linode.com slash changelog. GoTime is edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music for GoTime is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.